You're following a Redbud Groups lesson featuring the Gospel Project. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. Redbud Groups meet Sundays at 1010 a.m., but we have other small groups that meet throughout the week. Grab your Bible and study with us. We are going church, growing disciples. Enjoy the lesson. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? This is the Gospel Project. We're in Unit 34, Session 1. It's Persevering in the Mission. And just to kind of give you a synopsis of this before we open up in prayer, this is the Gospel is the bridge. And what we're trying to do with the, when we're sharing is we have God's story and my story and the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news is the bridge that connects the two. And what we're going to find as we go through this lesson is that we should always be ready. And this is an obvious. We should always be ready to share the gospel with as many people as possible. Um, and I would suggest that we have an elevator version. What I mean by that is imagine you're on an elevator and you have a chance to witness to somebody and they're getting off on the next floor. You should have something that piques their interest in a matter of 30 to 40 seconds. Um, not that you're going to, I mean, if you get lucky and they accept Christ right there after 40 seconds, that's going to be a great thing, but it doesn't work that way. But we should have an elevator story to tell our story and how God's connected to us through the gospel. Um, and remember in our storytelling, uh, our story to God's story through the gospel, it's just like with the apostle Paul, he had different ways of telling what, how he was connected through Christ to the story of God. I mean, it's not that we're changing anything. It's always truthful and honest based on the scripture, but we have to be able to look at somebody and see what their need is and then tell them not so much what they need to hear, but except for the fact that we're trying to tell them they need salvation through Jesus Christ, if that makes sense. So just kind of have an elevator story. Um, 30, 40 seconds, maybe something a minute or two, just depending. Don't make it some elaborate thing um, because you'll scare people off, especially in our climate today. Um, here's the session in a sentence. It says, God calls his people to fulfill their mission of faithfully preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's our mission. That's the, the lesson, persevering in the mission. <coughs> the mission is to bring others lost souls to Jesus Christ using the gospel as they bridge to connect our life to God's life. All right, let me open us up in prayer, then we'll finish. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here today. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you provide for us each and every day. And oftentimes in those trials and tribulations, they're meant to teach us something and humble us so that we can always remember that you're in charge and I am not. I pray, Father, that as we go through this lesson, that you open our hearts and minds and let us be ever mindful that you are the one in charge and we are just merely through our free will to be obedient in our love and desire for the lost. I pray these things, Father, in your holy and blessed name. Amen. All right. So again, persevering in the mission. And we're in Acts chapter 19. Um, and it's verses 1 through 20, and we'll literally cover all of those verses. I know if you look at between the second and third point, it goes from verse 10 to verse 18, but in reading the lesson and preparing for the lesson, I thought it was really hard to understand 18 and 19 if you didn't have the prelude to that, which is verses 11 through 17. And so we'll talk about those things, and then hopefully that'll enlighten us a little bit better on what verse 18 and 19 mean. So... In your book, you have this. It's that little story there, um, and I believe it's on page 11. <clears throat> it's right under the group time, and it's this. He's talking about um, having witness or uh, this young person talking to him, and it says, I just want to know God accepts me even though I know all the wrong I've done in my life. How many times do many of us get stuck in that position? I will tell you honestly, and if you've heard my parts of my story, that's where I was stuck for 20 years. 
I placed God in a box. I didn't think my God was big enough to forgive me for all the things that I'd done. I had received my calling into ministry, and for 20 years, I refused to respond to that call because I kept saying to God, do you know what I've done? Do you know who you're asking to do this? And just as believers, I think we often do that. And that's what this young man is writing about here is that how can God accept me for all the things that I've done? I know what I've done wrong. How can God accept me? And if we stop for a moment and think about this, we, <clears throat> we place God in a box and make God a little God. God is a big God and he is able to handle and do all things because he is God. We cannot and should not limit the power of God. From God's perspective, or as we're going to see as we go through this lesson, once the Holy Spirit indwells in us, we have that same power um, within us and this, that we can do the things. And we'll see that through the Apostle Paul. What I want to do is I'm going to do this a little differently than I've done it in the past. I want, to, want you to turn to chapter 19, verse 20. We're going to get the end of the story before we get into the beginning. And I think it's very relevant because we're going to see what is the end of the story. So again, it's chapter 19, verse 20. And it reads like this. In this way, the word of the Lord flourished and prevailed. The word of the Lord flourished and prevailed. So we're going to see how that happened um, as we go through this lesson. But that's the focal point that I want us to remain focused on is what happens to the word of God. And we notice that it said it flourished and prevailed. So one of the things, and I've said this in other lessons, and I want us to remember this because I think other than the object, the idea of fear or being rejected, the fear of being rejected um, to being ridiculed and things like that, is that we often think that when we share the gospel, it should be an immediate reaction. Even if in my elevator story, when I said 45 seconds and the person turns to Christ right away, it doesn't happen like that. We need to remember that salvation is not an event. It is a process. And we're going to see that in this first point. It's a process. It's an ever-changing process. It's a growing process. Think about the farmer who tills his soil, plants his seed, fertilizes, hopes for rain and water, um, sunshine. He still has to do what? Wait on time. It doesn't happen overnight. If it did, we'd have more food than we already have uh, on the shelves around the, the, the country and sharing with other nations in the world. We'd have a lot more. <clears throat> All right, here's point one. Keep in mind, it's an event. I mean, it's not an event. It's a process. Point one, preach the gospel. Preach, I'm sorry, preach the message of the gospel with clarity. Preach the message of the gospel with clarity. Acts 19, 1 through 7, verses 1 through 7. I just want to, I'm going to do this a little bit different this time, and I'm going to commentate as I read certain verses and pass certain words and things rather than reading them in a chunk and then going back. The first thing I want us to talk about, it says, preach the, gospel, the message of the gospel with clarity. So how do we preach with clarity? We preach with clarity, even in my classroom, and I'm a history teacher. How do I teach with clarity? <clears throat> or if you're a business manager, how do you teach somebody a skill with clarity? The way I'm able to do that clarity is because I know. Okay, so which means as believers, we have to be in the word, in church, fellowshipping with one another, so that we get in the know and it becomes almost like second nature to us. And then it's real easy to share that with someone else. As we're talking to them, we're able to adjust faster. And I would argue that some of that fear that we have in sharing the gospel of Christ will be mitigated and removed because we won't have the fear. I think oftentimes people are fearful of the, what questions they might be asked and the fact that they may not have an answer. And I've said this before, and this is a tactic or a strategy that I've learned in the military when I was briefing a three-star general. I was totally nervous on what questions that he was going to ask. And he asked a lot. But he was satisfied with the fact that I said, Sir, I do not know the answer to that, but I will get the answer and get back to you. 
So if I found the answer before the next morning when I briefed him in the mid afternoon, I went and gave him the gave him the answer. Or if I gave it in the morning, I gave it to him in the morning. But I found the answer for him, and I think most people will accept that. So if they ask you a question and you don't know, you can turn to your pastor. You can turn to scripture, you can turn to your Sunday school teachers, somebody that you know that might know the answer and ask them to help guide you in how to answer that question. So don't be afraid to answer the, the gospel, to witness to others for the fear that you may not know the answer because none of us know all the answers. <clears throat> all right, here we go. Chapter 19 in Acts, verses one through four. It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, <coughs> did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Okay, I'm going to stop. First thing is, in verse 1, it says he found some disciples. And in the commentaries, these are the disciples of John. And you'll see that in the in verses 3, 4, and 5. You'll see that that's who they're alluding to. But just so we'll understand, these are John's disciples. And so remember Ephesus to Jerusalem. Because all of John's ministry was around the Jordan in Jerusalem in that area. So why are John's disciples now in Ephesus, which is way over in Greece? And just so you can get the span of distance... It's 1,600 plus miles, about 1,680 miles. And for reference point, if you're trying to reference that, it's driving from or going from Lubbock, Texas to Washington, D.C. That's how far away from their home base that they were at. And I would argue, and this is strictly me, I didn't see it in any of the commentary or resources that I was using. You have to remember that Herod was after John and beheaded John. And so probably some of his disciples said, hey, we need to get out of here so that those that doesn't happen to us and so that, and that's strictly greg um trying to guessing the time period and what's going on in that in that region of the world um but the question that paul he and he's going to ask here in, in verse two through about verse five or six he's gonna he's gonna interrogate these disciples of john so keep that in mind it's basically an interrogation and so the very first question he asked is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So the question is, what are we supposed to believe when we're baptized? Because John is baptizing people and we, he baptized the Christ in the Jordan River. But what are we supposed to believe? And to believe something means that you accept it as true. And so we're going to see through this interrogation process with Paul to the disciples of John what their response is and so let me read the interrogation it says did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed no they told him we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit some of the commentators said that that was a little hard to believe and those are my words a little hard to believe because Pentecost has already occurred the flaming tongues and people for sure around Jerusalem have taught um, and talked about Pentecost and the flaming tongues over their heads and all the people that were that accepted the Holy Spirit on that particular day So again, if these guys these disciples and there's 12 of them, which we learn in verse 7 um, If they did not know of the Holy Spirit that meant they left pretty quick after John was beheaded and Maybe honestly truly they did not know um, Verse 3 says into what then were you baptized he asked them into John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who came after him, that is in Jesus. And so the idea of repentance here and, Paul, and John's baptism is the idea of repentance is regret or remorse for my sin. And that seems to be where these disciples have gotten stuck. They, they realized that they were sinful, but they forgot the second half of John's message, if you want to put it in those terms. The second half was that the reason that we're repenting is because the Messiah is coming after me, and the Messiah is Jesus Christ from Nazareth. His disciples missed that point. And so they're stuck in the initial baptism <clears throat> of just seeking forgiveness of sin 
and they're forgetting about the, the other half of John's message or witness was that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that the Old Testament is pointing to. And so Paul, again, is interrogating them on this. He said, and then in verse 5, he says, they, When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So now, since they've understood this, they had the regret and the remorse as they learn in the first half of John's message that we have to seek forgiveness for our sins. We've highlighted our sins, but there is a second half, the acknowledgement that we need a Lord and Savior, and in that Lord and Savior, we find Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah that the Old Testament points to. He's the Messiah that the Gospels point to. And that's what Paul is telling them, that they only had half of it. And I'm going to pose a question to you, and it's a question for reflection. But you ask yourself, are you stuck in the first half of John's message? <clears throat> Did you seek baptism because you were merely seeking fire insurance? Because you wanted to be forgiven? And maybe you know, and we'll come back to that term here in a minute, you know Jesus Christ. But are we really truly obedient to the mission that Christ has given to us? That's a point of reflection. And I'm going to skew your answer a little bit and tell you probably not because you can go into any church in the United States except for the big mega churches and you will find a lot of empty seats. So Christians, regardless of denomination, are not fulfilling the mission of Christ. They're not spreading the gospel, at least with clarity and perseverance. And then it says here in verse 6, And when Paul, laid, when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Let me just tell you tongues, this idea of tongues, real quick, and that's not the point of this lesson. The pastors covered this uh, in previous parts of the year on Wednesdays. Tongues is the known languages of the world. That's what we Baptists believe. And that it would be like if I was speaking in tongues because I was at a Korean church, I would be speaking Korean to them. Or if I was in a Chinese church and I was overcome with the Holy Spirit. It's not some mystical language that we just, that um, sounds like gibberish, but I'm speaking languages that are known to humanity. Um, the other thing that was a little bit for de up for debate in the commentaries is this idea of laying hands. It was baptism, laying hands, and then the Holy Spirit. Baptism, laying hands, and the Holy Spirit. And this is the only time amongst the commentaries that it, it where this pattern, if you will, takes place. Baptism, laying of hands, Holy Spirit. This is the only time that that pattern takes place. The thing that we need to remember um, from verse 6 is that the Holy Spirit comes upon us, not in a single process. It may Each person is going to be different. The manner in which the Holy Spirit comes upon us is different. There is no pattern. There's no consistency. And it's meant to be that way because it's individualized. And again, we talked, we're going to talk about that in point two and three. We're going to talk about this individuality of Christ. It's not a it's not a collective where it just comes on to everybody. It's individual. I have to individualize and personalize my relationship in life with Christ. <clears throat> and in that, the Holy Spirit indwells and comes to dwell in me through an individual nature in my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, but this is, let me just read what I wrote. It says, His, His, the Holy, Holy Spirit is, coming is consistent. It is consistent with believers. It's vital to every part and it's an initial, it's our initial commitment to Christ and the mark of what it means to be a believer is to have the Holy Spirit in us. So John's baptism of repentance is regret and remorse or the idea that we realize our sin and we change direction. We're going this way in sin and darkness and we we receive the grace of God and we change course and we go this way um, and we receive the Holy Spirit. We have a change of mind and we move away from our sin. And that's important. Again, that's something that I'll cover here in point two, moving away from our sin. Um, so just keep in mind that God as the Holy Spirit does not follow a formula that can be re replicated. It's personalized to Greg. It's personalized to you. 
It's personalized to that person. Just like the message, the bridge, the gospel, it's personal between my story and God's story. That bridge has to be personal. And though we may change it, we're not changing anything from the truth. We're keeping our story in the truth of the gospel, but we're trying to connect God and the person through the gospel. Okay? And I beat that one up pretty much. Uh, one other, there's a question in your quarterly. It talks about what are some things people may base their hope of salvation on other than the gospel of Jesus? And the very first one that should come to mind for most of us is you'll hear a lot of times, and it's one of those myths that Satan tells us, is that I'm a good person. So I can do, as long as the good outweighs the bad, that's what will get me to heaven. I can do good works. Like to build brownie points, if you will. Um, sometimes people will say baptism. Again, going back to that question I asked uh, about John's disciples. How often do we become baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, and then we don't do anything else with it? We've, I've received my fire insurance. Kind of poke fun at it. I've received my fire insurance that I'm not doing anything outwardly. It's all inwardly because now I can't lose my salvation. And so I don't have to do anything else, which is not a true statement. Um, it could be based on the fact that I pray all the time. That could maybe be your good works. Um, family name, reputation, um, comparing ourselves to others. I'm not as bad a sinner as that person is. We do that a lot um, as believers. Um, remember I said in a previous lesson, God does not have grades of sin. There's sin and then there's not sin. So if we're not sinning, then we're not sinning. If we're sinning, there's no grades. There's not an A sin and a B sin and a D sin. There's just sin in the eyes of God. All right. And the fill in the blanks. It says personality of the Holy Spirit. The Bible not only affirms the full divinity of the Holy Spirit, but also his personhood. Divinity and personhood. All right, point two. Persevere in the work of the gospel. This is Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. Persevere in the work of the gospel. Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. And let me just pose the question. It says, persevere in the work. So what is the work? And we see that in the Great Commission. The work of every God-obeying Christ-fearing, spirit-dwelling believer should be the making of disciples. That is the work of the church. That is the work of the believer. There is no other organization that can do that, as the pastor has said uh, in his sermons. The government can't do it. A retail store can't do it. A fast food store can't do it. It is the job, the responsibility of the church to be obedient in the work and that is to make disciples. Let me read you something that's seemingly unrelated. And I'll pray that I make the right statements to connect it. But you will find this in Leviticus 23.22. Leviticus 23.22. While you're getting there, let me just tell you something. We all, <coughs> we all know if we've lived 20, 30, 40 years. We all know that we live in a time period without consequences. My wife was telling me a story yesterday about an individual who registered for a training class and could not, was grilling my wife and could not understand why she could not get credit for the three days or two days of the training class just simply because she registered. It's a Zoom meeting, so the, the link hasn't gone out yet, so she can't click on the link. She hasn't attended any of the Zoom meetings, but just because she registered for it, she should get credit. That's the trophy mentality, participation. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody has to feel good, and that's the time period we live in, and that's why when I was reading this, persevere in the work, this is the verse that came to my mind. It's in Leviticus 23, verse 22. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap all the way to the edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest, 
Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord your God. We know in psychology and sociology that when people do things, they feel better about themselves. That's why God gave us free will to, to make the choice to obey him or not. He could force us, but then is it really truly love if he forced us? I could force my children. I could force my wife to love me. She could force me to love her. But is it really truly love if it's forced upon you? And that's this right here, this gleaning, leaving the corner. The farmers in Israel were told to leave the corners of the edges. And they weren't told how big that was. So that was left up to their discretion. But they were told because God knows that in doing something, we'll feel better about ourselves. And that's, for me, what that was. We will feel better as a, we will feel better at ourselves as a believer in Jesus Christ when we're out discipling others. We will feel better as a body in the church if the church is out doing its mission in the work of the gospel, making disciples. So it is our job as believers in the body to share the gospel with everyone. And you're going to see that that's what Paul does here. Again, we're in Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months. Let me just tell you, we're going to find out here in verse 10, he does something for two years. And so historians have argued that this time in Ephesus that Paul's there for a period of three years. <clears throat> we know it's two years and three months and then there's the, in the other parts of the writings it talks about a period of time and so it kind of meshes out that it's a three-year time period um, but as as Jesus did and the other disciples the apostles the first place they went was to the synagogue so Paul's in the synagogue talking to Jews speaking boldly for a period of three months Arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Arguing and persuading. So in this, what I what I took this and understood this to mean, because we're in Greece now, and remember, and the Greeks they almost prideful and pompous about their their rhetoric and give me a topic as you learned in other lessons. Give me a topic and I'll just pontificate and show you how smart and intelligent I am on a topic. So these are the these are the, the Jews are being in this area are probably very deeply influenced by this um, notion of uh, Greek rhetoric and being f kind of full of themselves and arguing and debating and logic. And if you study history a little bit, you know that that's the Greeks consider themselves more intelligent, more logical, more rational, Good. more reasonable. All right, take two. We had a technical error, so it's going to seem a little. Redundant for yeah, redundant for a little bit for some of this, but we're in point two. It's persevering the work of the gospel, and I've already talked about all that, making it to the disciples and sharing it with everyone. And I think the last thing I heard was um, in these verses, historians have proven that Paul's living in Ephesus for a period of three years, and it's real easy to see. In verse 8, it says, for a period of three months. And then in verse 10, it says he went on for two years. And then later in some other verses, it talks about for a period of time. So they kind of lumped those three things together um, and concluded that Paul has, was in Ephesus for three years. So um, <coughs> in the readings here, this is before we actually... I just want to make sure, again, this may be redundant because we had a technical error. But I'm going to go back, and I hope that you got uh, Leviticus 23.22. I'm going to read Leviticus 23.22 again, and I apologize if it's re repetitive. Um, but it says, 23.22, When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap all the way to the edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord your God. And the reason I thought that was relevant, that's what popped in my head when I was talking about this, because our work is making disciples. And we know in psychology and sociology, the idea is that it's proven that when we achieve something, we accomplish something meaningful, not a participation trophy, but we actually 
do something meaningful, that that gives us a sense of pride and accomplishment. And I would argue that, that that's the same thing with the church. The church is the only organization which the pastor has spoken of from the pulpit. Um, the church is the only organization that can make disciples. And so in the reading of Leviticus 23, 22, it doesn't say how far from the edges you have to be. It's just telling the farmers to leave some so that the poor people who need to feed themselves will, will not take a handout, but they will still be able to go and accomplish something because they're going to have to pick it out of the field. And that's what the church is. The church should feel accomplishment whenever missions, the souls are saved, a mission is accomplished by making disciples. We should feel the same gratis, gratification and satisfaction when we when we bring somebody to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? We should be sharing with everybody. And you'll notice here in the beginning, as is historically true with Paul, Jesus, and the other apostles, where's the first place they go when they enter a town? They enter the synagogue. So Paul is speaking to the Jews in the synagogue. And how is he speaking? <coughs> he is speaking boldly over a period of three months. And remember with this idea of the Jews, uh, I'm sorry, with the Greeks, with the Greeks, there was this idea that you just give me a topic and I'll speak on it forever and ever and ever and I'll show you how smart I am. But one of the things that we take away from the Greeks is the idea of logic, ration, rationality, intelligence, knowledge, using data to win or refute an argument. Um, and that should be the case even in modern times, whether it be in the church speaking the truth about Jesus Christ, or whether it's in the world of politics and government speaking the truth, we should be able to speak the truth and not get attacked through feelings, emotions, and passions. It should be, and that's what's going on here in the synagogue, is that Paul spoke boldly for a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So Paul is arguing and persuading them um, within, this, within this particular synagogue. And at some point in time, in verse 9, it says, but when some became hardened and would not believe, because they couldn't defeat the arguments rationally, logically, data-based, if that you want to say it that way, um, truthfully, honestly, they had to return to they had to turn to feelings, passions, and emotions. What did they do? And that's usually how you know when somebody's losing an argument because they can't refute it logically and rationally. They have to turn to emotions. They start yelling and screaming at you, spitting in your face, telling you you're an idiot. And in this term right here, the term that's used in this writing by Luke is would not believe they began slandering which slandering just means making false statements. So because I cannot defeat you rationally, I have to turn to our emotions and I'm going to criticize you as a person. It has nothing to do with the argument. Or I'm going to totally make false statements. It has nothing to do with the argument. But hopefully if I yell it loud enough and often enough, somebody will believe the lie that I'm putting out there. Um, what are they slandering? They're slandering the way, the way, and I put mine in quotes, um, because up to this point, Paul has been willing to speak boldly and have an open debate, or if you will, to use the church term, to witness. Because he's trying to talk about the truth of the gospel. And in the argument of the way, what they're talking about here is not something that's new. A lot of times we think, well, we're talking about the way of Jesus. But you'll notice in your quarterly, way is capitalized. So it is, what it means is a way of living. And even in the Old Testament, there was a way of living, a manner of conduct, ethically, morally, righteously, religiously. And let me give you a couple of these. I, gave, I have two verses in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. The first one is in, Le, is in Leviticus. Nope, it's in Exodus, sorry. It's in Exodus chapter 32, verse 8. Exodus 32, 8. And this is what it says. This is the Old Testament now. It says, they have quickly turned from the way I commanded them. So God gives us a way of living. 
He desires us to be on a certain path, if you will. <coughs> to have a certain structure within our life and manner of conducting us. And the rest of that verse says, they have made for themselves an image of a calf. So I'm, God tells us that there's a way he wants us to live, a way that's ethical, it's moral, it's righteous, it's holy, it's safe. And we, through our free will, make a decision to turn to sin, like in this verse. The second reading from the Old Testament is in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, chapter 5. I get there a little quicker because I tab mine. Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 33. 533. Follow the whole instruction of... The Lord your God has commanded you. Not part, not some, not the part that you like, not the part that you say I don't disagree with. All, all that God has given us so that you may live, prosper, and have a long life in the land you will possess. All, follow all the instructions. God has a way that he wants us to live. It is our responsibility, once we confess our sins, repent of the sins, submit to God, it is our duty and responsibility to obey what God has given to us. And in Matthew chapter 3, in Matthew chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, because verses 1 and 2 Three, they, they're kind of a, as a group, and they really tie into the point I was making in point one about John's disciples only getting half the message, hearing half the message, adhering to half the message. They missed the back half about the, the baptism of repentance and how that's supposed to point us to our Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so here in, ver in chapter three, it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent. And here's why we repent. Not just because we're supposed to know our sin, but we, we know our sin and then what happens? Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. He, the Messiah. A cry of one, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Straight paths, that's the way we're supposed to live. Live on the truth. Prepare the way for the Lord. We prepare the way by living the life that Christ instructed us to live from the Father. So they couldn't win their argument through rationality, knowledge, intelligence. So they turned to slandering the way of God. And I would argue that while in their attempt to try and slander the way, and that's why I'm spending some time on this, slandering the way of the way that we're supposed to live our lives, the New Testament goes even beyond that. The idea of conduct and a manner of life, ethical morality, it goes beyond that in the New Testament to it's God's plans for salvation. And that's what I read in Matthew chapter 3. Is that now it's not just a way of living, but in that way of living, it leads us and points to the Messiah. And then we uncover our sin. And then through that, we repent, confess, <coughs> submit, and obey. So they so what does Paul do here? He was speaking for three months boldly to the Jews, and then when they started to slander, he removed himself. He removed himself and withdrew, it says, in front of the crowd. He withdrew from them, taking the disciples. And I would argue it's not just those 12 that were mentioned in point one, but also any new disciples that have been created through the three months of witnessing in the synagogue. Those that were maybe on the fence. And conducted discussion, discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So there was some debate about Tyrannus, whether he was the owner of the school or if he was just a teacher at the school or if he was a owner and, the te and a teacher. The thing that I would really take away from there is that for two years, every day,
hall conducted discussions and he it was open to anybody who wanted to come i guess he had to put up with the slanderous ways in the synagogue because that was the jewish place of worship so he moves to a greek school where logic reason intelligence knowledge is supposed to be and the idea of passion and feelings and emotion are supposed to be removed from the arguments and we're going to logically debate these and probably using some of what we know as the Socratic method, you ask a question and rather than me give you the answer, I ask you a question so that you come up with the answer on your own and it's not a forced answer from me. I use that method in my classroom a lot and the, the students may or may not know what I'm doing, but I don't normally answer a question with an answer. I ask them questions about the question. I've just found over my 20 something years of teaching that that's just a better way of doing it. Um, because then you arrive at the answer. I didn't force an answer upon you for you to accept the answer. You logically and truthfully concluded that that was the answer to the question. And Paul does that for every day for two years. And just a side note here, another one. Um, it says every day. There was some readings in the commentaries that talked about in the heat of the day. Here in Texas, we talk about siestas for an hour or two, three um, they took a five-hour break, according to some of the historical commentaries, from about 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Paul was no longer making tents or mending tents. That was his skill to take care of himself. Um, he was actually in the lecture hall in the heat of the day, talking about the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and you'll notice he separated himself from those people who wanted to be, if you will, bullies, slanderers as the the writing says and he opened it up this went on in verse 10 this went on for two years so that all all anyone that wants to show up all the residents of asia both jews and greeks heard the word of god so he now he's having an open debate and it's a give and take debating what is right and what is wrong um and answering all the questions that are pondered at thrown at him and then allowing people to ponder those and digest those for two years that's a pretty long time i go back to the idea that i gave you early on a lot of times we think that evangelist discipling sharing the gospel is a event you know, I say it, you should accept it. Whether I spend 45 seconds or 45 minutes, when, I'm, when I say amen, you should just accept it. And it doesn't work that way. Again, like I said earlier, it's not any different than the farmer. The farmer has to till the ground, prepare the soil, plant the seeds, fertilize, water, sunshine. And then what's the most important factor? Time. He has to wait. And that's what we do when we disciple. We have to wait. It's not a, it's not a, you can't force it. The Holy Spirit will make that person ready when that person is ready by the Holy Spirit. So we can't get frustrated or fearful or deny that it works because it takes time. We may get lucky and have our elevator moment where we spend a minute with that person going up and down two, three floors and we share our, our gospel message with them. And they say, brother, I need more from you or sister, I need more from you. Where do I? And you say, come to the church. <clears throat> or I'll come to your house, I'll call you, whatever, however you do that, it's going to be different. There may be some people, and I don't wish to equate this to sales, but in sales, you have to make 10 appointments. You have to make 10 calls to get one appointment. You have to make 10 appointments to get one sale. And so it's a numbers game. And you, and usually with in sales, when those nine people tell you no, you don't bother them again. You just move on. Evangelism, discipling is different. We don't move on. We... Keep telling the truth and, sh and answering the questions and sharing like Paul did for two years. It was a process. It doesn't tell us how many people were saved at this point in time. But a lot of people obviously were interested because Paul did this every day for two years. The question in the quarterly says, what are some ways believers can demonstrate perseverance in the work of the gospel? And let me just tell you, and <clears throat> this is strictly Greg. But I'm going to tell you that the answer is fellowship. There's a lot of things they wrote down here as possible answers or good answers. But the bottom line is fellowship. Believers can demonstrate perseverance in the work of the gospel. is through fellowship. What is the first arrow in our circle on the for the red bud symbol? It's meat. 
<coughs> I'm not telling you that we should not meet people outside the church, but what I am telling you is that fellowship and coming to the church, meeting with brothers and sisters and sharing the gospel, being active in the church, connected to the church, grounded in the gospel, sharing the gospel, striving for holiness, showing love of others, applying the gospel to our own lives. All of those things begin in the church. We won't know what we're supposed to say. We can't share love with anybody else outside the, in the dark world unless we're sharing it and building and strengthening it inside the church. Meeting is important. If for whatever reason you're watching this and you haven't been coming to church, come to church. Fellowship with, with other believers. Strengthen your faith. Gain clarity in the truth of the gospel so that when you come across that lost person, you're able to answer their questions. And remember, again, I said our, the truth never changes, but it's God's word. God's story and our story and the connecting piece is the gospel of Jesus Christ. How you tell that, like Paul does in various letters that he writes, Paul doesn't change the truth, but he changes the presentation on how he presents it. And you may, you'll learn those things when you come in fellowship with other believers. The truth never changes. Scripture never changes. It is non-changing. But how we present that to a, a person we will be able to ascertain that and perceive what they need so that their faith is being strengthened through your message, your bridge, as this lesson started out, the bridge, the gospel, the salvation of Jesus. So I'm going to tell you, beloved, it is fellowshipping with one another. Then we will have what we need to have to go out into the darkness to find the lost. We'll, and we'll be strengthened by that. And we'll be able to, as Paul did here in verse 8, speak boldly of the truth of the kingdom of God. And then the next question in the quarterly talks about what are some specific examples you have witnessed to believers persevering in the work of the gospel. And I'll just give you some examples. This is a reflection on your part. What have you done? I mean, different roles that I've had in different churches. I've comforted people. I have a, a sense of empathy, empathy I gained as a kid. Uh, empathy, I can sense if somebody's off their game. They're not normally the way they are. Um, and I'll go talk, try to talk to them and ask them questions. I do that with students when they're entering my room. Um, I've done hospital visits, trying to comfort people when they're in a hospital bed. Um, before our, it's been about three or four years now, I used to be a volunteer with one of the hot, local hospices. I mean, I was assigned to the veterans because I could connect through my veteran, my veteran uh, stories. And so it made it easier to talk to them and, and make a connection quicker. Um, I've made calls. I've received calls, texts. I try to get back with people, um, questions and answers. Somebody may ask me a question in church about something, and I'll go try to find the answer um, as quick as I can because I know that's something that's weighing heavy on their heart. Um, and then just in general, teaching like this lesson today, teaching Sunday school or uh, preaching when it when I when the pastor's out and I and I, I preach, um, all of that is trying to comfort and strengthen believers. All right, point three, and this one's going to be a little longer, um, and I'm going to try and keep it short. But if you look at point three, it talks about pursue transformation through the power of the gospel. This is Acts 19 verses 18 through 20. I'm going to tell you, go to verse 11, because that's where I'm going to start reading, because I think 11 through 17 really help us understand what 18 and 19 are about. But before we do that, I want to explain pursue transformation. The idea of transformation is a metamorphosis, Metam the idea of morphing into something totally different. The actual dictionary definition says a drastic change in form and or appearance. So when somebody looks at you as a believer in Jesus Christ, they should look at you and notice, man, there's something different about him. Man, there's something different about her. You want someone to walk up to you and say, I want what you have. What is that? And then you can tell them your story and how the gospel connected you to the story of the father. 
but it's amorphosis. It's a, like a caterpillar going into the cocoon, the baptismal, and coming out the other end as a beautiful butterfly. Or, and this is a little goofy here, um, Clark Kent going into a phone book, phone booth, and coming out Superman. There's a transformation. There's a difference between the two. There's a difference between the caterpillar and the butterfly. So that's transformation. We should be transformed. And what are we being transformed from is sin. And that's why the word through is very important in this, through the power of the gospel. And so it's through. What's the through getting us? It's to move aside our sin, to push aside, get it out of the way, get it out of our purview, take it away from us, to separate ourselves from that so that we can achieve our final destination, which is to be reunited with the Father. That's our final destination. All right. So let me read. Let me go to Acts 19, verses 11. You'll understand why I'm reading this. And I'm going to commentate as I go through this. <coughs> it says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hand. So that even faith cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So God has transformed Paul into this person that he wants him to be. And as I've said earlier, and you'll hear me say it a lot as we're closing out this lesson, if you're truly in Christ, we need to remember that it's not just getting that fire insurance so that I don't have to spend all eternity in damnation separated from the Father, but really, truly, it's like the baptism of repentance. John's disciples believed in the repentance, but they missed the second part of that was pointing to the Messiah. So if we really truly have Christ in us, then we have the power of Christ. We have the power of God. We have the full power of the Holy Spirit. We are, there is nothing that we should fear. Nothing that we should fear. We have the power of God in us, but most times we don't believe it enough that it doesn't manifest itself. And you're going to see that here in this next couple of verses. <clears throat> Let me just tell you one other thing before I start reading verse 13. In the Jewish community, as well as the Gentile community, during this time period, there was a belief in exorcists. Um, and the, the more elaborate, the more exotic, the incantation was to remove the evil spirit from the person, seemed to gain a person's notoriety and or wealth. And so just keep that in mind when we read the next couple of verses, because now it says in verse 13, now some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches, the Jesus that Paul preaches. So right here, Jesus is not personal to this individual. He's trying to just capture capture the name of Jesus. And how many times do we have leaders in the church that just try to benefit from the name of Jesus, but really not doing in and through Jesus what they're supposed to be doing? So, and that's going to come back to bite him here in a minute. Hey, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. Side note, historically, there were at least three temples. We know the temple in, in uh, Jerusalem. There's also at this time period a temple in Samaria. And there's a temple, a Jewish temple in uh, Egypt. And the idea of the high priest, some of the commentaries talk about this guy not being a high priest. That may or may not be true. I didn't do enough research on it. Um, but the idea of the high priest was that it was a position pretty much for several hundred years that was bought and sold. Um, I aligned myself. There were a couple of families that were bought, vying for the high priest of Jerusalem. And when they didn't get that, they started their own temple in Egypt. And they aligned themselves with whatever political allies were in power. And then that political ally would align, would align to try and keep control. Let me put it that way. To keep control of the Jewish community by saying, this is your high priest. And he's in Egypt or he's in Samaria or he's in, in Jerusalem. And so that position of high priest, he may or may not be this guy, Sceva, may or, not, may or may not be a high priest. And I didn't do enough research. So that's just a little history of that when they talk about it. 
And then in verse 15, it says, the evil spirit answered them. I think this is beautiful right here. Remember, he said, in the, in the name of Jesus, the one that Paul preaches. So Jesus isn't personal to him. Jesus is not personal to these itinerant exorcists. And this is what the evil spirit says. I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? In another version of the Bible, uh, Bible that I have, it doesn't say recognize, but I respect Paul. So I know Jesus, and I respect Paul, but who are you? calling on the name of Jesus. Because Jesus was not personal to him, these seven sons of Sceva, they're not personal to him, just like in our lives. When Jesus isn't personal to us, we cannot harness the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do the things, and that's why we let fear overcome us, because we don't truly have the Holy Spirit deep ingrained in us. It's not personal enough. I'm not saying we don't have the Holy Spirit in us, but we don't have him deep enough in us that it's grasping a hold of our lives and removing fear. This guy didn't have Jesus in him, and the demon says, I know Jesus, I respect Paul, but I don't know who you are. And then the man who had the evil spirits jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them. So one man defeated these seven, so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded, because they tried to use the power of the Holy Spirit and they didn't have it in them. They were just mimicking words. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. So we see right here real quick in verse 11, miracles are being performed. In verse 12, Paul is curing illnesses even just by touching cloths and aprons head, uh, and removing evil spirits from people. In verse 13, there's magic and false religions. Um, in verse 15 and 16, there's false believers because none of this is personal. They really not accepted and become to obey Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so they're just trying to win a coin on uh, the name of Jesus. And then we get to verse 18, and now you'll understand why verse 18 and 19, why they, why these were important. And these are important verses, but I just thought 11 through 17 really helps make the point here. Verse 18, and many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, meaning their evil deeds, their witchcraft, calling upon Jesus and not having a personal relationship with him. In a note, sin. They're, they they realize that they're sinning. And part of their sin in verse 19 is while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everybody. And the in front of everybody is important. I would argue that's the reason why in Baptist, Southern Baptist circles, we would like for you to walk to the front when there's a call to go see the pastor is so that everybody knows that you're trying to separate yourself from your sin and then you're strengthened by the other brothers and sisters that are watching. That's why in most churches, Southern Baptist churches I've been in, after that happens, the pastor has them stand up there with somebody they know, and then everybody goes and shakes their hand and wishes them well. And really what we're doing is telling them, hey, brother, hey, sister, we got your back. We're going to be with you in this walk as, we, as you purify your life for righteousness, to have the Holy Spirit deeper indwell in you as much as I'm going to do my clone cleansing and you can help strengthen me. We're in this battle together between good and evil. <coughs> and then it said right there at the end, it says, collected their books and burned them. That's a personal sacrifice. And if you know anything about writings, especially in this time period, roughly 1900 years ago, 2,000 years ago, it is very expensive to have a scroll. In my inquisitive nature, I wanted to know. So it goes on and tells you, and I'll give you the math here in a minute. <coughs> we have to make a personal sacrifice. So if pornography is your sin and you have a subscription to one of those magazines, you need to cancel your magazine. You need to not go to, to the bookstores that or the the newsstands that sell those magazines, stay away from those. If it's, again, pornography and you're looking at it on your home computer, then get rid of your home computer so that that temptation is not there in the middle of the night for you to get up 
if you're an alcoholic, you obviously don't go to a club where there's lots of alcohol and all that kind of other stuff going on because, and you say, well, I'll just drink a seven up. You can't be in that environment. You have to separate yourself from that environment. It's like in, in crime, we talk about recidivism, the, the amount of recidivism for repeat offenders for crimes. And I would argue, and I don't know how we can do this legally or constitutionally, but I would argue that the reason that we have a high recidivism rate is because we release people back into the community to which we arrested them in. So somebody is a drug offender and they're, they get released to a particular community, all their friends who are still doing drugs that didn't get arrested or family members come back and circle around them and invite them and pull them back into that lifestyle. Thus, the person gets rearrested again. It would probably be better again. I don't know how we can do this legally or constitutionally, but they need to be released back into someplace else and told to stay away from. So if you get arrested in Lubbock, Texas, you need to be released in Wichita Falls or maybe Nashville, Tennessee or Orlando, Florida or something to make new friends and set them up for a better chance of success. Again, I don't know how legally in the criminal world we uh, we can do that with recidivism, but as Christians, we can definitely do that. Again, if pornography is the problem, we get rid of the computer, we get rid of those books, we get we don't go to places where we see women dancing uh, scantily clothed. We don't go to a place if we're an alcoholic where lots of alcohol is being served. Um, we stay away from those places so that we can build a clarity and a truth and an understanding and a foundation upon which we can stand. And then we're, it's always going to be a battle but at least we have more tools and clarity to do the battle. So these individuals separated themselves from those, so those, from those books. And that in itself is a personal, that is a, not only is that a personal sacrifice, but that's an expensive sacrifice. Okay, look in the second half of verse 19. It says, so they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. And so, in reading this, I, I learned that a drachma is a Greek silver coin, and that's how much a person got paid for their daily wages, one drachma. And I'm going to assume that it's roughly an ounce. I don't know for certain. I forgot to Google that or engine search that, um, how much that actually is. But let's just say it's one ounce. A drachma is one ounce. So 50,000 drachmas is what it cost them. I divided that by 365 days in a year and came up with the with the notion that that is 137 years, roughly. It's 136 and some change, but 137. So it's 137 years worth of wages. Put it in monetary context, 50,000 drachmas. I learned yesterday that the price of an ounce of silver is $28. So if you take the 50,000 drachmas, assuming that each one is an ounce, take that times... $28. That's $1.4 million in today's terms. So these people, not only did they separate themselves from a personal sacrifice from those items so that they couldn't draw them back into their lives and get their hooks back in them, but they also made a monetary, took a monetary loss of roughly $1.4 million um, in their commitment to change their lives. How many of us have something in our lives that has and has its hook in us and we just won't pull the hooks out because it's too expensive to change? It's I don't want to do that or it's not that big of a deal. I don't do it that often or whatever other excuse we give ourselves. Um, but what we have to do, beloved, is we have to separate ourselves from whatever is causing this. Um, I had a friend years ago whose uh, mother and father were alcoholics and the father realized he was going to lose his job as an alcoholic so he gave up drinking almost cold turkey because the wife took his suitcase down to where to the club and put it on this underneath his spar stool and said if you don't stop drinking i'm going to divorce you and leave you so he went to rehab got himself um recovering he was a recovering alcoholic but at the house when they would have house gatherings um, the mother would still be drinking alcohol along with a lot of the other people in the room and she would ask me and it was a sore sore point for the mother she would ask me Greg would you go to the store and buy me another six pack of beer and I would tell her no I cannot because your husband is struggling with alcohol and she would say well it's okay he says it's okay and I'm like well I'm not saying it's okay and I don't say that to toot my own horn but 
it caused a rift between my friend's mother and I because I just refused to help her remain an alcoholic and keep the hooks of alcoholism in her husband who was trying to change. And so we just have to separate. And as Christians, I think we, and that's the reason for the story as Christians, sometimes it's hard to stand up for those things. And it was hard. It was difficult to go over to that, my friend's house um, for, the, for a long time, many years because um, that was a sore spot because it didn't happen, happen way more than once. Um, and the response was, well, he loves me and says it's okay. And my response back to the mother was, well, how much do you love him that you won't do this in front of him? So that's what we need to do. I, and again, I will tell you, I, I think oftentimes when we, when we re confess and repent, enter the baptismal, we do it for ourselves. We do it for selfish reasons. And I'm not saying that's totally wrong, but what I'm saying is look at, reflect upon that and ask yourself, why are you getting baptized? And again, it's for the fire insurance. I understand that it's to gain your own salvation, but that's not the reason that we should be doing it. We should be getting baptized because what does it say in scripture? God loved us first. And because he loved us first, we should love him back so intensely, so passionately, so deeply that that's why we want to become baptized. We want to do for him because he did for us. He loved us. We want to return that love. We want to love God as much, which is not possible, as much as he loved us. That's why we should want to repent. And, I, and again, I'm not saying it's wrong if, if our reason was logically because I want to gain my salvation. I understand that. But to me, that's the same thing as the baptism of repentance and John's disciples. They repented of their sins, but they stopped there. How many times do we enter the baptismal because we now have gained our salvation, but we're not doing what the rest of it is? We're not transforming our lives. We're not doing the, we're not digging deep in our lives and finding those hidden crevices of darkness and pulling out the sin that's in them and deeply transfer so the Spirit, the Holy Spirit can deeper ingrain, deeper passionately get into us so that we have the full power of God in our at our disposal. Because it says that faith can move mountains. But I don't believe any of us right now have that much faith. Because we don't, we have still little pieces of sin hooked in our lives, and we will for all of, all of eternity, because none of us are perfect. Here's the last fill in the blanks. It says a new identity of the believer. When a person places faith in Christ, that person undergoes a fundamental change of identity. People should see a change in us when we become to know Jesus Christ. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation in whom the old sinful self is passed away and the new redeemed self is alive and progressing. And I would tell you, you could put transforming right there. Transforming, becoming more and more like Christ. So it's change, progressing, and then Christ. Those are the three blanks. Progr change, progressing, and Christ. And the question, the final question is, what are some ways believers can pursue transformation in their lives? And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, there's one way, there's a lot of ways, but I would argue that it all comes to a pinnacle, and it's that meat that we have in our red bud symbol, meat. And the make, again, we're looking outward, but we need to work also inward. We need to meet one another and strengthen one another, gain clarity of the truth of the gospel and the kingdom of God amongst ourselves so that when we go out there, we've strengthened the, the making disciples is that we've made better disciples of ourselves and that we can go out with clarity like Paul did and speak boldly of the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others can gain their salvation. So it's a real simple process. It's confess, repent, submit, be obedient or obey, and then share. Confess, 
repent, submit, obey, and share. And we strengthen all those with our confession of sin to one another, submission to the word of God as it's taught and worshiped. We do our Bible studies, our readings, our regular study, our memorization, obeying the scripture. Again, the way, the way to live, follow all the instructions of God. And then finally, faithfully sharing the gospel with others. And if you stop about, you think about the power of the, the power of the scripture, the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit as he's indwelling into us is this, is that throughout the history of Christianity, missionaries have gone places where they were at risk, not just health wise by a disease or a mosquito or a fungus or something like that, but also the indigenous population wanting to kill Christians for teaching the gospel. That's true even today. We have countries in the world that will put Christians in jail forever or behead you because you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, the message of Jesus Christ truly is freedom. This truth, the truth found in the gospel, it strengthens us. Otherwise, how would missionaries throughout history go to the countries and the places that they've been if they were not strengthened with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So surely, beloved, surely, we can go out the church doors or the door of my house or the door of my workplace and we can minister and share the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ with those in our neighborhood because we don't really have the fear of death. We may have the fear of rejection, and sometimes that feels like death. We may have the fear of speaking. We may even have the fear of, I don't know the answer to that question. And I've said in other lessons, when I first started briefing a three-star general, we had an area of operation, and I thought that that's what I had to, I had to know everything about that area of operation, the happenings in that area. Well, after my first briefing with this general, he asked me a lot of questions that were outside the area of operation. And my boss told me, he says, don't you know he's going to be the next commandant of the Marine Corps, so he needs to know the entire world. And I told my boss, I said, that would have been some great information to know before I went up there and looked like an idiot. But the thing I took away from that is the fact that the, everyone I briefed, if I did not know the answer, I just simply had to tell them. I'm sorry, sir, ma'am. I do not know the answer to that. I will research it and I will get back to you. And I honestly did that. After my morning briefings, if it was 10 o'clock and I found the answer or two o'clock and I found the answer, I would go right back and ask the chief of staff, can I see the, can I see the general so that I can give him the answer to the question he asked? Or if the general told me, just bring it tomorrow when you come back for the next morning briefing, then I would, that's how it'd start off. Sir, the question you asked yesterday was, so we can do the same thing in discipling. We don't have to know all the answers. Know your story. Know God's story, the big picture, and know how the gospel connects them. If somebody asks you a question, all you have to say to them is, I'm sorry I don't know, but I'll get back to you. And honestly get back to them. Go ask your Sunday school teacher. Go ask somebody you know. Go ask the pastor. Go do the research. We have the internet, and we can find a lot of stuff on the internet and then verify it in scripture to make sure that it's gospelly true. We can find the answers. Don't be afraid to share the word of God with any anyone wherever you're at. All right. Last three things and then we're finished. These are questions for reflection. There I believe they're on page 15 in your quarterly. It's it's, it's on the page it says my mission. How will you Pursue transformation through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's me. How will I be transformed? And by being transformed, I become more powerful in the word and I become more powerful in spreading the word. So reflect upon that this week. How will you pursue transformation? What can you do to get the claws of darkness out of you so that you become more pure, more Christ-like, and more Holy Spirit indwelled? Second question. What are some ways your group needs to pray for and encourage one another? Specifically for the purpose of perseverance in the sharing of the gospel. I'm going to answer that one. I'm going to tell you right now. It goes back to the circle we have on our church, our church logo. The very first one is meet. 
That means fellowship. We have to be coming together as a body. We have to be strengthened as believers. We have to study the word on our own, but we also have to do things corporately so that we can bounce things off, share things with people, questions, the way people reacted, and learn from other, others' experiences so that we're strengthened in the kingdom of God. And the last one is, with whom will you share the good news that Jesus is the Savior we all need to be saved from for our sins? And I'm just going to tell you, you need to find five to eight people who you regularly witness to and witness to them regularly. I go to the same cashiers. I try to find the same waitresses when I go to the restaurant so that I can, I'm building a relationship. You just can't beat people over the head with the Bible as a moral code. There has to be a relationship. Just like there's a relationship with you and Christ, you and the Holy Spirit, there has to be a relationship between you and them before they will connect to the Holy Spirit and the gospel. Let me close this in prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for our salvation. A salvation that was made possible through the perseverance of your son, Jesus Christ. Let us endure life and death if we must, as your son endured life and death to rescue us from our sins. And we are grateful and thankful for the preserving work of the Holy Spirit to free us from our grip in sin. Now may we persevere in our lives, even unto death, for the sake of Jesus' glory and the fulfillment of our gospel mission. Strengthen us to endure all hardships, for we know they are coming mentally and even physically. And give us hearts to see the lost. I pray, Father, that you burden my heart for those that are lost, so that I may, through Christ, show them faith and your grace and the love that they have waiting for them from our Father in heaven. I pray, Father, that as we do these things, that those of us that profess to be believers of Jesus Christ, that we are deeper, more passionate, more allowing of the indwelling of your Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us so that we see the lost, find the lost, and witness to the lost. I pray these things, Father through your son's holy name. Amen.